And it looks like we are live. Thank you for joining us this windy Thursday. I'm joined with Dan McNeil of Miscellaneous Distillery in Mount Airy, Maryland. Looking forward to learning about uh, Miscellaneous's lineup of great spirits and kind of the philosophy behind the spirits that they're producing there. Uh, before we kick it off, I just want to let everybody know that um, when you're visiting distilleries across the state during this uh, stay at home period or whatever, uh, be sure you're wearing your masks. The governor asks that everybody that goes into a retail location has their mask on. So if you're visiting a tasting room uh, to pick up spirits, put your mask on, make sure that you're keeping yourself and others healthy. Uh, but keep in mind that all of our members are open for business, either for curbside pickup, uh, pick up directly in their tasting room for carryout uh, of cocktails and spirits, depending on the location. And many of them are even offering delivery options. And we'll learn about what miscellaneous is offering uh, when Dan chats. But thanks again for joining us. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments. We'll be happy to answer those as we go. And uh, enjoy. Dan, how are you guys doing? Doing awesome. Thanks very much for having us. Thanks for coming. Sorry about last week and sorry to everybody who uh, tried to join us last week. We were having some technical difficulties, but we seem to have worked them all out. I just like to think that that's our organic overlord, Mark Zuckerberg. There you go. Say his name three times and he'll show up in the comments. Yeah, I don't want to. <laughs> so uh, tell us about Miscellaneous. Give us a little bit of a rundown about the history of the company, kind of what you guys did to start the distillery, and uh, let us know who you are. Sure, thanks. So uh, Miscellaneous Distillery opened back in December of 2016. Uh, so our, that was when we sold our first bottles, but obviously our journey started a little bit before that. I had been working in political events such as you know, elections and conventions and then working for other nonprofits. And I was really just kind of burnt out on all that. So I started thinking about what I'd like to do. And um, I had a neighbor back in New Jersey where I grew up who was an upholster, so he could basically recover, you know, furniture. But you could also take a, a raw piece of, basically you could look at a tree and say, okay, I'm gonna get this many four feet, I'm gonna turn it into this kind of couch or whatever, and turn it into like just this really gorgeous piece of furniture. And that craftsmanship really inspired me. I knew I wasn't gonna be doing that, but I knew I wanted to do something uh, hands-on uh, where I'd have my own product at the end of it. So. I started thinking about what that meant for me, and I knew I had kind of this desire uh, and palate for craft for spirits, particularly rum and uh, rye whiskey. And I got to thinking about how I could get into that business. So over the next couple of years, I went around to different uh, industry events, conferences, uh, took a few classes, just kind of check on the viability of the industry, see if it was something that we wanted to get into. And it definitely was. So. I started thinking about where I'd want to set up shop. And um, my girlfriend at the time, um, uh, we both lived in DC, where now my wife, but she was from Maryland. Uh, one of my best friends uh, from my previous political life uh, had just bought his family's farm in Maryland. So it really made sense that they could grow the rye for us and we could get local inputs for our rum products from Domino Sugar over in Baltimore. So we really kind of hit the, that, you know, right niche of what we were looking to make and what the state could provide and um, have that history of Meg being from here as well. So um, that's how we ended up kind of in Maryland in general. And then, like I said, I really wanted to make a barrel aged um, rum that had just a different palette, different unique qualities to it that I wasn't really finding in the other barrel aged rum. So uh, I set out to make a, a white rum that really had a lot of full body so that when it came out of the barrel, it was even um, more unique. But um, we'll get into that in a second. Um, so we kind of used uh, our friend's farm as a focal point. Um, we drew kind of a 30 minute radius around it and said, you know, within this radius is probably where we want to set up shop. We went around to all these different towns, uh, Thurmont, Frederick, Mount Airy, Westminster. We, we settled on Mount Airy. Um, I, I grew up in a town more similar to this. And um, it was, it just had kind of that great Main Street feel and everything else. So it was really nice, uh, you know, best of both worlds. Um, and, you know, as far as the, the rest of the, the story, as far as our name, 
Um, miscellaneous is actually an acronym. So uh, McNeil Independent Spirit Creators LLC is the, is the business name and we do business as miscellaneous distillery. And it allows us to play in different categories uh, as we see fit. So whether it's our, our rums, our whiskeys, our vodka and our gin, you know, we get to we get to do it how we see fit, but not just be uh, kind of stuck in one one category as we move forward. So uh, that's that's kind of the back backstory on on the name of the distillery, how we ended up here. Um, what we've always kind of thought about ourselves is we're trying not to take ourselves too seriously. So our motto is live and drink by your own rules. We don't want you to you know, drink something because we tell you to drink it. We don't want you to drink something because we've advertised to you to the umpteenth degree that this is the only thing you should drink if you're going to have a good time. We want you to taste it. And if you like it, we want you to drink it. And we kind of, you know, we think that helps support the craft industry as a whole as well. Um, you know, don't just go grab the next bottle that comes out. Um, from say, you know, Buffalo Trace, just because they've got a, a great history. You know, go find something that really suits your palate. I, I make a bourbon that suits my palate. I make a rye that suits my palate. And I know that not every rye drinker or bourbon drinker is gonna love what I make. And I encourage you to go find what you love that somebody else makes. And it could be, you know, right at the next distillery down the street in Frederick or Sykesville or Baltimore or wherever. So um, try local first. You know, that's kind of what we're, we're hoping people will kind of take away when they come to the tasting room. So um, we have a portfolio of 10 products. So we've got uh, three rums, uh, vodka and a gin that are based off our rum Nashville. And then we have uh, five whiskeys, um, three ryes uh, in various aging stages, and then a corn whiskey and a bourbon whiskey. Um, everything is made uh, with raw ingredients. So we're not buying any spirit from outside and bringing it in, we are making it from the very get-go with inputs that we're sourcing. Uh, we're doing all the mashing, fermentation, distillations here, and all the barrel aging on site as well. So um, we'll go through four of them today. Uh, our white rum is our whiskey rum. Our barrel aged rum is Poppy's Finest Rum. Our uh, gin is called Gregarious Gin. And uh, our bourbon whiskey is Brill's Batch Bourbon Whiskey. I'll get into all the names in a bit here. Um, one other thing I like to point out about the, the distillery is we've always had a very you know, charity focused drive. So from the get go, we knew that this was going to take a while to make money. And from the very beginning, we want to be giving back to the community, giving back to charities um, as, as early as possible. So instead of charging for tours and tastings um, at the tasting room here, uh, the distillery, we ask for a donation that we pass 100% along to our charity partner, which we swap out every quarter. Um, so for the past um, past quarter, it has been Meals on Wheels of Central Maryland, which has been very fortuitous for us and them. You know, we've been looking to get hand sanitizer that we've been making most recently into the hands of people that need it. And um, we couldn't think of really a better partner than Meals on Wheels, having volunteers going out, serving kind of a high risk population with the COVID-19. This way we could get them a product that they need right away uh, and, and keep everybody safe. So um, we always try and swap out every quarter, but it might be that we, we stick with the Meals on Wheels for a little while considering the, the increased the demand that they're seeing, but you can always go on their site if you're looking to volunteer with them. Um, we, we love for them to begin a little bit more of a bump in their volunteer numbers as we get going, so. One of the messages that we've been trying to communicate a lot about the industry is that distilleries aren't happening on the neighborhoods and the communities where they open by chance. I mean, it's, it's a thought out thing and they truly do operate as anchors in the community. It's a small business, it's hiring local people. Um, it's something that people may take for granted when they see distillery, they don't realize the impact that it has locally. And one of the things that we've been talking about is that as a community member, many of the distilleries in Maryland are doing what they can to give back to the community, obviously through the hand sanitizer options. But that concept that you have about kind of paying it forward as a donation to a another beneficiary 
uh, when somebody comes to visit you is really unique. And I think that that's pretty wonderful. I didn't know that. And I think that that's really cool. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, that's, it, it's, it's definitely, we wanted to make sure we were giving back from the beginning and you get hit up constantly. Every small business does, you know, whether you're, you've got a small restaurant or whatever, and you can, if you have a restaurant, you can always donate some meals to something. You can donate a, a dish to a, a charity drive. But this was our way to make sure that every person that came in could, you know, it, it was another set of eyes on the mission for that group and also you know, maybe a few bucks in their pocket to, to help pay their volunteers, pay, you know, pay for equipment, pay for staff. You know, we've, so we've been open for three and a half years now. So that means we've gone through uh, about 12, 13, maybe even 14 different charities. So. Um, you know, each one you know, we've done uh, hurricane relief uh, for Puerto Rico with their when Hurricane Maria came through there. Um, so we did a quarter there, uh, and each each time we do that, we also make sure that we have an event at the distillery to bring in even more money. John will pull in another thousand dollars or so just in that one night for people to come out and support it. So that's awesome. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's, let's look at some spirits here. And uh, I mean, shit, it's 310, so let's, let's drink. Um, Can I interrupt before you jump right in? We already have a couple of comments coming in and I wanna give some shout outs. Uh, Chris was asking about the labels on the Risky. He says he loves the look. It appears that it was answered in the comments that yes, it is a new label, but uh, keen eye on somebody there who obviously knows your brand and is uh, very into what you have going on. Yeah, cool. And I also wanted to give a shout out to Abby, who's uh, the director of events for the Maryland Distillers Guild. She's watching. And uh, the Brewers Association of Maryland president and general manager at Milk House Brewing, Sarah Healy, who's a Mount Airy local, is also on watching and wanted to say hi. Oh, well, yeah. And I, I should point out, too, that you know, since they're both uh, uh, Milk House, uh, either active or alums, you know, we just picked up beer from uh, Milk House, I think it was yesterday, time doesn't really mean anything anymore. So I can't remember if that was yesterday or two days ago, but I think it was yesterday. We picked up a uh, thousand liters of donated beer from Milk House that we'll be turning into hand sanitizer this week. So weekend, I guess. So uh, thank you very much to them and to you know, Sarah uh, for helping coordinate all that. Sorry for the interruption, but I thought you would enjoy knowing that. Absolutely. So um, as part of our live and drink by your own rules, uh, you know, we, uh, we are very strong on drinking however you like as well. So I like drinking just from a, a normal low ball. I do have some wood Karens uh, as well for sale on, the, on our, our website if you're interested um, and shot glasses. And if you can see behind me, uh, we do have a shot ski. If there's ever four of us in here that, you know, just really need to take a load off and uh, enjoy what a shot ski is. If, if you've never had one, it's uh, four shot glasses on an old ski that uh, you fill up and everybody obviously has to take the shot at the same time at the same pace. So uh, pro tip, put the tallest people in the middle, put the shorter people on the end. That way you're not dumping drinks down onto the shorter people. They're the ones controlling the ski. Anyway, so Risky Rum was our first product. This was uh, blackstrap molasses and dark brown sugar as our base. Um, it is, uh, you know, ingredients come from Dublin over Baltimore Harbor. Uh, the choice of the ingredients was uh, kind of very specific. I, I want something that would carry over a sweetness so we didn't get a really kind of a stringent quality, uh, but yet still have a little bit, a, a lot of an earthy note. So that blackstrap molasses gives us a lot of that earthy note. Um, the dark brown sugar gives us that sweetness. So we get, Kind of a nice uh, profile from this, a good mouthfeel. Uh, first distillation is through a two plate column on our uh, 100 gallon still dragon still. Uh, second distillation is through a 26 gallon pot still from Hillbilly Stills. Um, that's pretty much true for uh, all our rum based or all our sugar cane based products. So um, all three of our rums, our vodka and our gin, all start off that same way. Um, as uh, was mentioned before, um, we did have a white background. You know, we try and incorporate that big red M on all our bottles. 
uh, that you'll see right here on the brills. That was kind of our original background. And when we were trying to redesign the risky a little bit to give it a little bit more flair, um, we partnered with a local artist from Frederick, Ed Becker from B. Dot Galleries. And if you see these examples of his artwork here, you'll see those examples here and then our gregarious gin as well. Um, we just really loved his artwork. We love supporting a local artist. We love supporting a friend. And I asked him if I could use his art as basically the background because I always had this vision when you're we pulling this together that I used a square bottle so you could see some sort of artwork on the back of the bottle um, and get that visual through the medium as well. So um, when I approached him about it, he said, yeah, absolutely, just choose whichever ones you like. Um, gin and, and vodka were really kind of great. We were able to pair that red M with the, the, the art. With the um, Risky, he has uh, in our hallway down to the, the main door, he had a, a print of a red, a, a red print, this, this image. And I just loved it. I, I just, as I was walking by, I could see a white M on the, on the laid over top of it. So I asked him if that would work out if I wasn't screwing up his, uh, his artwork too much. And he said, no, not at all. And I think it really, it really came out great. It really makes it pop a lot more than, than the white background with the red M. But back to the spirit. So we've got black strap molasses and dark brown sugar. Um, I, I'm pretty sure everybody's kind of gone over this before, but if this is your first one, you know, there's, there's three layers to uh, a smell um, when you're holding the glass. So you've got the glass tilted towards you. You can sniff up here towards the top of the rim. You can sniff in the middle and you can sniff more down towards the bottom. And you're gonna get three separate profiles throughout that. It uh, just has to do with how the alcohol is evaporating up and the properties that are kind of coming out of that. So we get kind of a, I'll take some water. So up, I get a little bit more citrusy. Middle, I'm getting kind of more of that uh, butterscotch. And down below, I'm getting that earthier note. So, you know, just kind of lighter, light, medium, heavy, kind of all the way through that. I try not to let the, the spirit sit on my tongue for too long so it doesn't impact. But then on the palate, like I said, I really wanted this to be more full body, something that didn't just evaporate off the tongue. It kind of sits there, sticks around for a while, and we really get that, that toffee flavor coming through. Yeah, I'm gonna have more. I like it. I like it the way it is, obviously, but I, I really love doing a squeeze of lime in this and just letting it hang out with the kind of sweetness balanced with just that little bit of acidity. Gives it a great profile. Um, it does well as a daiquiri in that case too, where you just add really, we, we like to use kind of a, a rich, simple syrup, a demerara sugar, along with the rum, along with fresh lime juice. It does an kind of incredible daiquiri, uh, but it, it's, it's built in such a way that it doesn't need to be masked by a Coke or you know anything heavier or sweeter or anything else. It just it stands on its own very well. I'm gonna go for some more of that. Nobody can blame you for that one. So you just mentioned the three different uh, approaches to the glass when you're smelling your spirit or sniffing the spirit and learning about the aroma. Uh, are there specific traits like aromatic properties that will find themselves in different places on the glass? Those heavier properties are going to sit further down on the glass. The lighter properties are going to kind of evaporate up. So that's why I got those citrusy notes more in the middle or in the top here and kind of that buttery, <clears throat> almost like butter popcorn right in the middle and those earthy notes hanging out further down. You know, you, you would find the same concept 
holding true if you're using a Glen Karen, which is a tulip shaped glass, or even a, a wine glass or something like that. You, know, you can still find those lighter, medium, and heavier properties um, just hanging out. So no matter the glass, um, short of you know the sample glasses we use here, which are communion cups, which really it doesn't lend itself great to uh, to the, the sniffing profile, but it, it sure does uh, economical and you know easy to measure out a quarter ounce that way. So the taster does not over vibe. I think little tips like that are handy for people who may be at home and trying to figure out how to approach the bottles that they're purchasing from local distilleries in a way that's, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more filled with information than just, oh yeah, I like the way this one tastes, you know, they can approach it with a new way to uh, experience the spirit. That's pretty neat. And, and that, it kind of gives you another background point too, if you're going to be mixing cocktails, if, you know, the, that's a good segue, you know, we have a, a rum here that really almost sometimes thinks it's a bourbon. And um, it does really well as an old fashioned, but you have to know what you're looking for, you know, how you're balancing an old fashioned out. You've got the citrus in the old fashioned, you've got the, um, you've got the sugar. And with, with something like this, if you taste the spirit and you say, okay, well, if, if I've got these sweet notes, I've got this, you know, I've got the spicy note, what am I gonna, how am I gonna, you know, how am I gonna pair this? I'm going to balance it out because I don't want to just be overly sweet or maybe you do, maybe you want to be overly sweet. You say, okay, great. I've got something sweet and I want to pile on. But if you want it to be balanced with a little bit of acidity, a little bit of, you know, floral, you know, something like that just gives you that balancing point where you can say, okay, well, I've got this scent up here. I've got this down here, this over here. What are the counters to that to give me a really well-balanced flavor profile, a really well-balanced cocktail? And before you move on to the next uh, spirit, I do have one more question. How do you approach pairing food and spirits? Again, our motto is live and drink by our own rules. That includes eating. Um, I, I really approach it as, you know, I, I still try and approach it as counters. So if I'm having, you know, say, say I'm having salmon. Um, if I have like a maple glaze on my salmon, I'm going to want something maybe a little spicier uh, to counteract that sweetness. So I might want to pull a glass of my rye to really pair with the salmon. But that's me. Like that's again, this is this is why I I, I really like the live and drink by your own rules. It is it allows you to say, oh well, you know, I really like sweet things. You know, I have a sweet tooth. I'm going to go with a a sweet, you know. Uh, you know, a dessert wine with my maple glaze salmon or, you know, a, a orange crush with, you know, something, you know, like a, a tilapia. And, you know, it, I, don't, I don't want people to think that there's any boundaries here. I want them to think that there are limitless options. I know it feels a little bit more limited when you're stuck at home and you can just go to your liquor cabinet and say, oh, shit, I only got like, 20 bottles and you know what am i going to do i don't have the right ingredients for this or that it's like you know you you probably have more options than you think um just start trying little bits with this that you know, take an eyedropper and you know drop in a couple drops of this one drop of that and see how that pairs together and then start scaling it up you know i i would rather when it comes to food i mean i've got a beef stew in a crock pot right now my guess is I'm going to go home and probably do a poppy's old fashioned with that. And that doesn't make any sense really. So that feels like heavy on heavy, but I can't think of anything better right now. So. So what you're saying is there's no wrong way. There is no wrong. You know, it's, it's like the outback. And you can't argue matters of taste. So why bother? That's what we like to think. All right. I, I truly appreciate hearing that. That's great. All right. Uh, also, shout out to Walker from uh, Blue Dyer. He popped in to say hello. What's up, Walker? 
So uh, moving on to poppies, there is a medium step in between our risky and poppies. That's our dew point rum. That's an oak infused rum. Our poppies is a true barrel aged uh, rum. So we do use new white American oak barrels, char level three. Uh, we get those from the barrel mill out in Avon, Minnesota. Um, and these are primarily coming out of 30 gallon uh, new white American oak barrels now. Um, what we found in using that new barrel versus what mostly you find in, uh, what you'll mostly find in liquor stores of like a Ronsacapa or a, a, you know, a, a, with a Flor de Cana, um, a Bat Club, any of that, they're mostly using a used bourbon barrel or some sort of used barrel. And that is going to take a lot more time. It's gonna, keep a lot more, depending on what their main ingredient is, it's gonna keep a lot more of that kind of rum uh, profile, uh, that sweetness. Whereas we're gonna get our sweetness from our raw ingredient, uh, the, the dark brown sugar, we're gonna get that earthiness from the black strap molasses. But then using that new barrel, we're gonna interact with all the, the, the charred oak. Uh, we're gonna pull out even more of those sugars, those caramels, and we're also going to get that smokiness. So what we're really finding with poppies, I'm going to need more than that. There we go. Um, is it tricks a lot of bourbon lovers because th that's what they're accustomed to. They're accustomed to sweetness and they're accustomed to that new oak, that smokiness. Um, they, most, a lot of them have never really had a really properly aged rum because they just, they hear rum, they think something like Captain Morgan, they think something like Cardi or uh, uh, Kraken or whatever, and they just immediately know that that's not their, their flavor profile. But when they, they taste something like our poppies, uh, they're really surprised that this is a rum that um, has done so well over the past couple of years for us to bring a lot of bourbon lovers over to the rum scene. So. I need to go back to water. Water, I should say. I, I, I keep saying it so that people don't think I'm just chugging something else. So we get up top, we get kind of a nice, again, we kind of get a nice, almost like a, a toasted almond. In the middle, we get a lot of that sweetness, but a little bit, like a little vanilla, yeah, and a little orange. And then down I get this kind of nice smokiness at the bottom of the glass. So what I've really found fantastic about the poppies is the way it can, it just, it lingers for so long. It has just this incredible staying power. I don't even need another sip. I don't think I'll need another sip for five minutes of this. It's how long this stays for. And as you let that develop on the palate, I just keep getting different levels of caramel, different levels of sweetness. But on each exhale, I get kind of this wonderful campfire, almost like sugar maple campfire flavor to it. It's just, it, it's really, it's really fantastic. You know, sipping rum, which is what I kind of always wanted this to be. Um, the story with Poppy, if you can see the bottle, or the label rather, through that, that is my great grandfather from Cuba. Um, his name was Henry Poppy, uh, is what everybody called him, uh, Henry Poppy McAvoy. Um, and he was, he, he moved there when he was two. He lived there uh, until he was imprisoned by uh, Castro in 59. Uh, 
was obviously in prison for about five years before they released him and he escaped to Puerto Rico uh, to live the rest of his life. He was uh, well liked by those who, uh, who knew him. Um, he and his family employed more than 2,000 people across the island um, selling kitchen equipment. And um, we are very happy to honor him uh, on the back of our, our Poppy Spanish from Bob. Yeah, that's, that's nice. I'm gonna keep drinking that. Um, but we, uh, yeah, I, I, this has been uh, one of our, our, our standouts. We, we kind of think this is the one that's gonna uh, get the most converts uh, to miscellaneous distillery. It did win double gold at San Francisco World Spirits competition last year. And um, we are very proud of that achievement. Um, it made it one of the top rated rums in the world uh, from an entry uh, a standpoint of entries. You know, they get more than 3,000 entries every year. Uh, so to be among those competing against rums from the Caribbean, Thailand, the Philippines, um, America, everything, you know, it's just, it, it really, uh, it was kind of a nice pat on the back that we're, we've got something, something special here with Poppies. And you know, we're, we're very big fans of it. And, uh, love being able to introduce it to people at the spirits festivals, at the beer festivals that we're invited to, you know, um, anything that Grown Fortify is putting on, you know, it's always a fun time. And once we're able to gather with large groups of people again, we will have many more opportunities to share it with many more people. That's what we hope. That's a really intriguing story about your great grandfather. Thank you for sharing that. Well, my pleasure. So was your, uh, you kind of mentioned what your ambition was when you opened Miscellaneous, but was your drive for rum based on kind of this lineage of your family? You know, it, I knew that if I got to this point that I would be naming a product after my, my great grandfather. And again, that design element where I wanted to be able to see through the bottle. I had this wonderful portrait of him. And I knew that for the past 10 years that I had this really cool portrait. And I thought it'd be really great if I could see through the bottle and see that image. A couple spirits with family, right? Yeah. So this is, if, if you know, you can kind of see his image through the bottle, but not really. As you drink down, you see more and more of his image. It's almost like a ghost kind of coming through. And we really love that visual element to it. Um, the other one that we have is, um, Gertrude's 100% rye whiskey, which we are currently sold out of. Um, the bottles, yeah, it's kind of hard to see, but this was named after my, my grandmother on my mother's side. We again had this great portrait. This is an image of, of Grandma Gertie uh, during World War II when she was making bombs um, out in Nebraska. So, you know, another kind of fun way to honor our, our family members. But uh, the other nice thing about that was uh, grandma loved her, her rye water every day. So it was really nice to be able to match you know, my, my great grandfather from Cuba with a rum and my grandmother on my mother's side with a rye, which she drank every day. So it really, it was really fun to be able to play off those two. And we'll get into Brills in a second and, and why that's got a red end on it. So going into Gregarious, um, so there's a couple couple stories I can tell about Gregarious. I'll be quick. One, I I I like gin, just fine. I never thought we'd be making a gin at this point, but um, as I mentioned, my girlfriend at the time, I then proposed to her. She said yes. And when you own a distillery and you're about to get married, you think, well, do I really want to go buy other spirits, or can I just make my own everything? so that the bar is fully stocked with my product. So that's what I did. I got crazy. I made sure I had enough of rums and whiskeys and bourbons and everything, you know, vodkas to meet the need for the bar. And, but, you know, the, tip, the most difficult one was gin. And um, I asked Meg what she likes in her gin. She's a gin fan and she, you know, wanted something 
you know, she gave me the profile. So I said, okay, well, let me see if I can come up with that. So I started playing around with a mix of botanicals and, um, you know, we got it within the first couple of tries. And I thought this was just going to be sold. We'd use it for the wedding. We'd sell a little bit here at the distillery and that would be it. Um, this is now turned into our top seller, which is a huge pain because I only have, you know, I talked about, I have a hundred gallon still for the stripping of the rum product. I finish that all in, in two 26 gallon pot stills. And then that product has five possible lives. It has one of the three rum products, our vodka, which is called virtuous vodka, or I do um, still it into a, my gin. I only have one 26 gallon template column still. The throughput on that is not very high. I get a handful of gallons each time I do this. And being that this is my top seller, it's what I spend the most of my time making anymore. It's, it's a, a labor of love because I love my wife and I want her to be happy. But um, if, if I could uh, go back and say, oh, you know what, so I, I don't think I'm gonna make you that, I, I don't think we're gonna sell that gin just yet. Give me, either, either get me a bigger piece of equipment or, give me just a little bit more time to build up a better stockpile because I just felt like we we're constantly running out of it, which is a good thing and a bad thing for me. So um, going back to it though, so same base ingredients, black strap molasses, dark brown sugar. Um, we distill up to 95% to make our vodka, so our virtuous vodka. I'll then take a portion of that if I'm not making vodka. I'll do a vapor infusion with juniper, pink peppercorn, lemon peel, orange peel, grapefruit peel and orris fruit, and that's it. So it's a nice, light, American-style contemporary gin. Uh, with that base as essentially, you know, a molasses, it gives it an a, a, a underlying sweetness and also gives it a, a more rounded mouthfeel than something that's maybe grain-based. The nose, is where you pick up the most of the juniper. And again, you're getting that juniper at the bottom of the glass, getting those floral and citrus notes more in the top and the middle. That pink peppercorn is really my favorite part of this because it comes in at the end. And, you know, we're at 43%, we're at 86 proof. It's not, a, it's not a hot spirit by any means. And people get confused when they taste it. They think it, the heat is coming from the alcohol. The heat's actually coming from that pink peppercorn, giving you that little bit of spice. So it, it, was, it was by design. I wanted to have that little bit of kick at the end that, that was imparted by something that also had a little bit of sweetness to it. So again, going back to that balance piece, I always like to try and have a yin to the yang. And this really was one of those elements that I really wanted to play with, with that pink peppercorn. Um, again, one double gold at San Francisco last year. So um, it was really, really kind of a nice, again, nice to have, but knowing that I've got a 26 gallon still to make it. When it turned into our number one seller, I was shocked and saddened by how much more I'd be having to spend, how much more time I'd have been having to spend here in late nights and early mornings. So, but it is, you know, we, we try not to do this as a gin and tonic that much. Um, being that it's a, an American style contemporary, uh, Jim, we just don't need to add a whole lot of sweetness because we already have that sweetness. So the tonic uh, already would be bringing in too much sweetness to balance us out. We actually just pair it with club soda or seltzer water um, instead, uh, just to give it the effervescence and open it up a little bit. Do you have a good tip for garnish? I don't garnish it. I know people tend to gravitate towards limes with traditional dry gins and things like that. Uh, yeah. Cucumbers have made their way into gin also, which is a, a very tasty treat sometimes, but. 
Honestly, my favorite cocktail with this, um, when I say we don't do you know, gin and tonic with it, but what we do, my favorite way to drink it is a pink gin. So just the gin, Angostura bitters, or any, you know, any bitters, um, you know, regular aromatic bitters. Uh, the Angostura gives it a nice pinkish hue though, because that's all you're adding. It's just a few dashes of the Angostura, shake it over ice, and then uh, into a, a tall glass, um, martini glass. It, it just balances it with the bitter property versus the sweet property versus that citrus. I think it, that's that's my favorite way I found drinking it. So um, as far as pairing it with, uh, you know, there, there is no really garnish that you can put in that. Um, maybe uh, I might do like a, what are they called, edible flowers? That'd be kind of a nice garnish. Can you get those yet? Probably, I'm sure it would look gorgeous. Yeah, yeah I'd do that. All right, so look fantastic. Fancy. There you go, edible flowers. Yeah, edible flowers would start matching the, uh, the background on the, the, the gin bottle, which again, like we said, Ed, Ed Becker at, at B Doc Galleries, uh, you know, that's, that's a beautiful artwork and we've got the originals hanging here in the distillery. So uh, just really kind of the edible flowers would be a nice pop to that, I think so. I do like that. As much as I don't like to admit, I, I do like that gin. And Dan, one of your friends, Peg, is in the comments. She said pansies are edible and they're growing now. So that sounds like a perfect addition to the, uh, to the drink. I love you, Peg. Thank you. All right. So switching over to bourbon, I'm going to switch my glass up to my beast bourbon glass. Um, so Brill's Batch Bourbon Whiskey. Um, Meg was in charge of naming this one, as she was in charge of naming most of them, like Risky Rum and Gregarious Gin and Brill's Batch Bourbon Whiskey. She loves alliteration. She loves wordplay. Um, Brill is also Meg's middle name and her grandmother's maiden name. So in going back to that conversation about family members, this is named after Meg's side of the family. She was a little bummed, I get a little bummed that we hadn't named anything after her side of the family. Everything had been named after mine. So I said, okay, well, we'll name the bourbon after you. Her grandmother is still alive. The other two had passed away. We didn't have a really great portrait to put in there. So we just said, let's keep this the big red M for now. And if we need to do a little redesign um, or we find the exact right photo of, of grandma uh, um, on Meg's side that well, we'll, we'll swap this out. But, um, it is a 51% corn and 49% rye mash bill. Nothing malted, so it has a very unique profile in that regard. Uh, all the grain comes from our friend's farm here in Carroll County, Hickory Hall Farm. Uh, and then we are um, mashing, I'm sorry, we're milling that all on a old water wheel powered stone mill from the 1800s over in Berryville, Virginia. We bring it back here mash ferment double distill and pot stills. So we've got a, a 350 gallon uh, mash ton that we also double as a fermenter and triple as a stripping still, and then do the finishing distillation from those pot stills. Uh, and then everything's barrel aged in small format barrels here at the distillery. So this would have been um, in a 10 gallon barrel for one year um, with the smaller format barrels. You need less time in the oak to achieve uh, the same color you would with something like a 53 gallon barrel um, just due to the surface area of the uh, of the woods the amount of liquid that's inside so think of a, a very you know a, a, say a one gallon barrel you're not going to you can buy just for home aging of beer or, or spirits or cocktails uh, you don't want to leave it in there too long because you can over oak uh, the product that you're you're trying to uh, impart with that oak profile. So we do one year on our 10 gallon barrels. Um, if you're out at the liquor store finding it, uh, just look on the back of the bottle. It'll have how long it's been aged, uh, the shorter amount of time, the smaller the format barrel. But we try and keep the flavor profile consistent from batch to batch, so that you know we're you if you grab. A uh, five-gallon barrel bottle versus a ten-gallon barrel, or fifteen-gallon or thirty-gallon, you're getting basically that same product. Mm -hmm. 
So, as I mentioned, 51% corn, 49% rye, nothing malted. Um, the goal here was to really have something with a sweetness up front and a really nice rye profile on the back. Um, I, 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 I kind of played around with it a little bit, and, but with any whiskey, you know, you're tasting the white whiskey initially, and as long as you're starting off with a, a really great base white whiskey, um, and you're, you know your barrels are great and intact and with good char and good profile, um, you're almost guaranteed to come out with something great on the back end. We knew that the, the secondary distillate coming out of those spirit runs was had great flavor, a little bit of sweetness, followed by that little bit of spice. We threw it into barrels and we're not disappointed. So we get we're getting a nice kind of bourbon so hard to do at the end. I give the people that do the judging at all these competitions and everything a lot of credit what they go through in two or three days, what they've tasted, what they've been able to pick out, which is, it's very incredible. So again, down at the bottom here, I still get a lot of that earthiness. So I'm almost picking up the minerality of the soil, almost like a little bit of kind of clay in the middle and getting kind of that um, almost graininess. Um, yeah, it's, it's almost cornbread-y, um, but with a little bit of like a spicy butter. You ever had like a cornbread with like a, an ancho chili butter on it uh, is what I, I, I get in that middle. And in the top, I really get, um, I get kind of a light oakiness, almost just like fresh wood. Um, it's really interesting, but that a lot of a lot of earthiness at the bottom. And again, what I was going for with that corn and rye balance, the first initial impression is is all corn. It is very in your face, um, just like you, you bit into the cob on the 4th of July. And that fades pretty quickly to go into that medium, um, almost what I, I would almost call it like a normal bourbon palate, what you, what you expect when you, when you drink bourbon, that kind of oak, grain combination that you're used to. That middle only lasts for half a second before you're right onto the drying and spiciness of that rye. And that's what kind of makes this so unique. Um, you know, I often have people come in and say, well, you must be using some sort of malted barley or something else, otherwise you can't call it a bourbon. Um, you know, the regulation stipulates it just has to have 51% or more corn in the mash bill. You can go up to 100% corn if you want. And it can still be a bourbon as long as you're aging it in new white American oak barrels and made in America. But we really like this balance of using the bare minimum corn and as much rye as we can humanly pump into it because we are, we are rye people. And if I have my Gertrude's, that's the next one I'd be tasting, but I'm 100% out of it. So um, this, is, this is really great. Um, I mixed this as, a, uh, as an old fashioned the other day and I mixed it as a Manhattan. Um, I like it as the Manhattan way more because it's so rye forward. Chris in the comments says he thinks that this makes the best old fashioned without a doubt. So there you go. 
Can't argue matters of taste, right? <laughs> and Peg agrees that the rye is what makes this uh, such an exceptional spirit. I have a question for you. When you were talking about the ingredients list, you pointed out specifically that it is not malted rye. What flavor impact or uh, what, what does a malted rye lend to a spirit versus an unmalted rye and why did you select unmalted? So we, we played around with the idea of, of malting um, and I really thought that every time I tasted something with a malted rye in it, I got a lot more of a sour note um, in, that, in that malted rye. Uh, and I didn't want that. I wanted, I wanted the rye to be very powerful in that and not muted and kind of, I, I felt like the malting would almost mute that. So we use a synthetic enzyme um, that doesn't impart the flavors that the malting would. So we can keep a lot more of that grain profile through the spirit. Very cool, thank you. So I know that you distribute most of the portfolio at local uh, liquor stores, retailers. Um, how are, your guests able to continue to get your products from you directly while things are so uh, limited in terms of engagement with people? Sure. Uh, we are open for uh, curbside pickup. Uh, so uh, if you go on our website, miscdistillery.com, uh, you can select either curbside pickup or delivery. Uh, delivery is within a 30 mile radius um, and it that you spend $40 or more and delivery is free. Um, so you'll be able to pick up uh, cocktail sets. So basically like a bottle of spirit, um, one of our mixers and um, uh, sometimes I think a bitter is included in there uh, depending on the cocktail. Uh, you can get our, all of our spirits that we have in stock. We're currently sold out of the Brills. We're currently sold out of the Gertrudes, but um, all the rest of our spirits are listed on there. And we do have uh, 100 mil versions of those spirits, most of those spirits as well. Um, so if you just want like a sampler, uh, test them out, see which one's your favorite, and then uh, move on to the, the full size 750. That's a great way to, to kind of dip your toe in the water. Um, and then we are also, uh, selling soap using our spirits. So there's a, a local artisan, uh, single barrel soaps. She uses a little bit of our spirit and she worked with us on the flavor profile. And she even worked to incorporate the artwork that's on the gin bottle into the gin soap that we're selling. So as the CDC is still recommending, stay home, wash your hands. We have soap for that. Um, you might not be able to find bar soap or, you know, little pump bubbles of soap at the store, but we've got soap, uh, soap of plenty here at the distillery. So, you know, log into the website, pick your favorite soaps, some spirits, and we'll, uh, we'll either bring it out to you, uh, curbside here or, uh, drive it out to you and, uh, and, and get it right to your house. So you don't even have to leave. That's awesome. Um, and you mentioned that there are 10 spirits in your portfolio currently. What do you see happening in the next couple of years? Are there any spirits that you're really itching to add to that lineup that, uh, that you've got concocted? Or are you uh, planning on kind of sticking with the 10 that you have? And you know, it's kind of very stupid, Jim, but I was working before this all kicked off. I was working on another gin. I'm, I'm an idiot and, you know, apparently a masochist. So um, I was... I was working on another gin that was grain based instead of molasses based um, and had different set of botanicals and everything as well. But um, that's on the hiatus right now since most of our production has gone to hand sanitizer. I would expect to see that probably next spring. Um, and then uh, I really do want to get a, a malted whiskey out. Um, it's, you know, I, I kind of tell the story of getting into drinking spirits um, when I was younger, and I won't say how old. Um, if you've heard the story before, you know how old. Uh, it's, I, um, Chivas was my, my first foray into this. So I've always had a soft spot for Scotch whiskeys and would love to, you know, dip my toe into that water of, of a, a single malt uh, 
product that I can, can call my own. So, and if you notice on our whiskey products, uh, we do spell it without an E uh, as a nod to both Meg and my Scottish heritage. So we'll continue that tradition as we go forward. That's awesome. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to share with folks? I've added a link to the shop in the comments here. I've added a link to the distillery and uh, the descriptions of each one of the four spirits that you tasted today. Uh, anything else people need to know? Uh, just, uh, I, I think you guys have all heard this before, but um, the more we can engage with you on social media, uh, the better chance we have of, of engaging with more people in a farther reach. So uh, if you can like us on Facebook and Instagram, um, that would be amazing uh, if you share any of the things that we do that you find to be really cool. That's amazing. Uh, if you can find our products in, in the liquor stores that are open, that's amazing. If you um, know of any of the accounts once they're back open, uh, restaurants and bars that don't carry our products, ask them to carry our products, that would be amazing. You know, those are the kind of things that we, um, that's, that's how we grow and uh, it's how we can engage with you and, and get you what you want. And in the comments, Meg made sure to add that your Reward the Bold members are going to see an interesting release of Barrel Age Gin later this year. Yes, they are. So we, this is the, I, I guess that would be another product. This is a test of, of the gregarious gin in a used uh, bourbon barrel. So we're going to see how that all plays out. Um, it's in a 10 gallon barrel. Uh, our Reward the Bold members, which is our membership program here, um, they get uh, their name up on the wall, which I'm pointing at, which you can't see. Don't worry, it's definitely there. Um, and then a bottle of batch one of whatever we released that year. So that one's specifically designed just for them. Um, if it turns out exactly how I think it's going to, which I, I, I had a little sample, it's, it's already in the, in the right direction, um, I will start even punishing myself more, making more gin to put into barrels to, um, yeah, basically I'm going to turn it into a gin distillery, I think is, is, is the long short of it. So Dan is not leaving the distillery for the foreseeable future. He'll be there making gin uh, into eternity. I have a leash around my, my foot that only lets me get to the front door to answer it, not to actually leave. And you see, that's why he's standing and that the uh, camera height is just high enough that we won't notice. Yeah. Well, Dan, I appreciate you taking the time to join us this afternoon. Thanks again for uh, coming back after the hiccup last week. No I, I felt so bad about that. And there you go. For everybody that's watching, we really appreciate you taking an hour to uh, join us this afternoon. Please do what you can to stay healthy and stay safe. If you have the opportunity to help support uh, these great small businesses like Miscellaneous and uh, the other distilleries here in the state. Please find a way to do that. Uh, a lot of them are taking contributions for hand sanitizer efforts. A lot of them are offering delivery services to you. And just about all of them in the state are open for you to visit their locations and pick up uh, great Maryland made spirits uh, from the curbside. So check with your favorite local spirits maker and find out how you can buy their products. We will check in with you next week and uh, visit us at marylandspirits.org for any other uh, inquiries. Thanks again. Thanks.